Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome to another K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. By the way, K-Cups come in three sizes, single, double, and triple shots, or roughly one minute, five minutes, or ten minutes in length. So if you don't have time to throw back an entire caffeinated career conversation, these K-Cup mini episodes of T4C can give you a quick caffeinated fix, whether you're on the go or you only have a few minutes to binge. So grab your mug and take a chug, because it's time for a caffeinated career triple shot K-Cup with my guest, Anish Raman. So let's flash back to when you were in college, Anish. You went to Harvard, where you majored in government. You have already somewhat foreshadowed the fact that from the time you were in middle school, you knew you wanted to be a journalist. But did you know exactly what you wanted to do when you graduated in 2001? Ever since I knew I wanted to be a journalist, I knew I wanted to be a White House reporter. Part of that I've come to understand in the racial awakening that we've experienced in my shift from white modeling to non-white. Part of that was I kind of wanted to be president, but I didn't think a non-white person could be. And so I thought, well, the next best thing would be to cover the president. Not that there were a lot of people of color as White House correspondents, but that somehow felt more attainable. And so from very early on, I wanted to be a White House correspondent. Growing up, our dinner conversation was always immediately following the family, you know, watching the Peter Jennings and World News Tonight. And we always talked about what was reported on. And I had a very clear connection between what reporters reported on, what we were talking about, what the nation was talking about, and then impact in terms of policy and and cultural changes. So I really understood journalism to be about impact. And so White House correspondent was the North Star. Now, what was the way to do that? At the time, there were two paths. One was go to local news and rise up. And I had hosted a kids sports show at a regional network called New England Cable News. But I knew that I didn't want to do the local news up because I knew that for a long time, I'd be covering news that I didn't necessarily feel like was that systemic societal impact level. And the other way was to go cover international news and work your way back. And so after college, I was really focused on the international path back to D.C. and to the White House correspondent job. And so that's when, while I was doing the Fulbright in India, I started talking to the BBC, CNN, other bureaus there to see if I could start my career there. While I was doing the Fulbright, 9-11 happened. And so it became clear that news organizations were staffing up for a prolonged period of coverage out of the Middle East. And so that's when I ended up at CNN in Atlanta, worked overnight as a freelance assignment editor. It was just whatever job to get in, over-delivered on every task I was given to be able to stand out. And then After a bit, I think a year, year and a half, I recognized, okay, now I have to kind of pull the trigger on becoming an on-air reporter because otherwise, if you're not deliberate about that, it doesn't just happen. And so I went to my bosses and said, look, this is what I want to do and I'm ready to do it. And because of the credibility I had built, they said, okay, well, we've got this posting. You'll remember Tom Mintier was the Bangkok correspondent for CNN. He was retiring, job posting, opening. Do you want it? And I was like, yes. It's an international reporting job. It means I'll be covering like real issues across Southeast Asia. I might not be on TV all the time in the US because we only care about that region every so often, but I'll learn how to do this. I'll like earn some credibility and then come back as a White House correspondent when I'm ready. So I go to Bangkok and it was the best learning ground for a young reporter because we were still staffed there like journalism of old. I had a producer, Nurnot, who is an amazing teacher, a cameraman, Kit, who was amazing, a sound guy, an office manager. It was almost like this 
school built just for me was waiting in Bangkok. And so I went there and started covering the news out of Bangkok. And then 10 months in, this big tsunami happened. This is December 2004-ish, December 26th. And that becomes the first really big global story that I'm part of. And so I still vividly remember that day in Bangkok, feeling the hotel, or sorry, the apartment building I was in, swaying, not really realizing what it was, getting a call, two people are missing from a tidal wave in Bangkok, we think you need to go down there, deciding we should go down there, realizing the airport's now closed, how are we going to get there, what's the first flight in, getting all our gear. And then that was the beginning of a whole new chapter in my career, because then in the course of a month, I started appearing on every major CNN show. We, to our credit, or to CNN's credit, really focused on that story in the U.S. and were able to mobilize a lot of donations to a part of the world that otherwise is, is often looked over. And so then I had this big moment. And then the question becomes, what do you do next as a reporter? Because if you don't capitalize on that sort of currency of having a big story, people forget pretty quickly. So I knew after, after the tsunami, I needed to figure out a way to go somewhere else because Bangkok wasn't a top story in normal times. And at that point, the war in Iraq had started to get to a point where it was clear the war wasn't going to end soon. And it was also clear that the big name reporters felt less compulsion to keep going because the story just felt like it was perpetually about this like level of violence that didn't seem to abate. So that meant there was an opening for people who were young, who didn't have families, who were ready and willing to live in a war zone to go live in a war zone. And so I vividly remember having that conversation with my bosses and saying, I'm ready to go to Baghdad. I'd love to go with CNN, but I'm going anyway. And I'll find someone to work with when I get there. And so they said, yes, let's go, go there. You become Baghdad correspondent. And so that was a whole nother chapter of my career now. I was in a war zone covering a story that on any given day was the most violent story in the world. It was this issue of how to then, given the, the sort of constancy of violence still break through to the public consciousness, that something important was happening. It was also a struggle as a person because you're in a war zone. Journalists were getting kidnapped. So when you would travel, you were in armored vehicles. It was really isolated as an experience. And so I did that. And after about a year and a half, I could tell that I was starting to go a little crazy, as one would expect when you live in a war zone and normalize to that. You get a huge amount of ADD. It took me, I think, a year or two years after Baghdad to actually sit through a movie for two hours because you're so used to constant activity and stimulus. You see the world in black and white because it really is an everyday story of life and death. And that means nothing matters. There are no rules to life. You just do what you're going to do. And I just understood that to be something that could have long-term implications on who I was as a person. And so then I remember calling my bosses and saying, I need out. And at that time, Iran was starting to become a big story. Ahmadinejad, who was president, was really becoming a space of nuclear defiance. And so he said, OK, you can have Iran as your beat, but we'll make you Middle East corresponding to living Cairo. You can cover the region. And so that I felt like was the job before the job. I'm going to do this job. I'm going to do it as best as I can. And it is going to set me up as best as possible to become a White House correspondent. And then you know what? I go to Cairo. I'm doing the job. I'm going into Iran. And I look back at the coverage of the presidential primaries leading into them in 2008. And I can start to see things unraveling in terms of journalism that used to be about impact, but was becoming more about just punditry and voyeurism. First, I, I, I noticed it where I would go into places like Iran and want to do a story on dissident rappers in Iran, but was told, no, just talk to the camera about what it feels like to be in Iran. And so that was like the first signal. Okay, this isn't what I signed up for. This doesn't feel like it's worth me sacrificing the level I'm sacrificing for. And then as I like looked on TV at White House correspondents, I'll never forget, I saw one White House correspondent doing a story about Barack Obama's workout routine at a gym, going through like the way he lifts weights. And that's not to say that there's not a story to be told on that, I guess, but that is not what I thought of as a White House correspondent's job. And so suddenly, reaching the point where I have the job before the job I've always wanted from when I was a kid, and realizing that that job is no longer one that I want, 
it was really, really hard. So the fall and winter 2007, in a way that people used to be jealous of me in college because of the certitude I had, where other kids were trying to figure out what they wanted to be, I knew reflexively and deeply I wanted to be a White House correspondent. Suddenly that was gone. And I was lost. And I didn't know where to even begin to get back up. Do I go to grad school for the sake of it? If so, do I go to law school or do I go to business school? Do I go to PR? But that's not something I had ever thought to do. But that's what journalists sometimes do when they leave journalism. Do I go home or do I stay abroad? It was really, really tough. And then to to the Steve Jobs point, sometimes the dots just start emerging around you, even as you're struggling to find them within. Barack Obama wins Iowa. And suddenly this moment is unfolding back home that going to that original point of why I conceded I could never be president, that concession started to feel incomplete. Maybe America was a country that could elect a black man as president. And if that was going to happen, that's the thing I wanted to be part of. And I had a moment at some point around May where I recognized if I didn't go be part of that campaign, I would regret it for the rest of my life. And so I left a very established job with a very good income that was the job before the job I always wanted to have to become an unpaid intern at the Obama presidential campaign in Chicago, where no one knew what to do with me. No one was waiting with open arms and a job. I had to bring donuts on Saturdays to kind of barter with the security guard to let me in to the office because interns weren't supposed to come in on the weekend to be able to show up in front of folks on the campaign until I finally found a fit as a speechwriter for then Senator Biden. And that began then the next chapter of my career as a speechwriter. I love that story because you took a big risk stepping away from journalism, quitting what most people who were interested in journalism would have given their right arm for a job as Middle East correspondent. Did people try to talk you out of it? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, at every level, people within CNN said, this is a mistake. You'll never be able to come back. At the time, at least, there was this idea of a clear line between someone that goes into an administration and someone that can be on TV as a reporter. So it was everything you worked for, you're about to implode. There was also, how is a black man going to win in America? You're joining a campaign that's going to lose. And then what are you going to do? Having joined that campaign, you can't come back. There was just the instability in terms of my career. What is this going to mean? But I will say it was both the riskiest and easiest decision I made in my life. And that's for two reasons. One, my parents got it because they were drawn to the same thing I was drawn to in terms of what was emerging with the Obama campaign. And that meant a lot to me that they got it. And two, I had saved enough during my time at CNN. Now, I I only recently learned there's a thing called investment. I only understood as a kid of immigrants, you're supposed to earn and save. If I had known about compounding interest, I would have probably invested more of what I had saved at the time I was at CNN. But what I had saved gave me agency. And that's what I think about when I talk about economic opportunities. In there is economic agency. It's freedom. It's the ability to define what is enough on your terms and to be able to then make decisions in your life on your terms. And and I had savings from CNN that gave me a financial cushion to be able to go be an unpaid intern for a bit. But I, you know, I, I very much believe in in regret mitigation. I I live my life in order to try and not regret anything. And so that was really the anchor of that decision. I just knew if I was not showing up in Chicago at that campaign headquarters, which I thought was the most interesting place on earth to be, I was going to regret it. So that's what made it easy. But it was certainly risky. We could have lost. I could have not ended up with a clear path of speech writing. I could have not ended up at the White House, which I really was focused on to make it all make sense. And so there were a lot of things that were unknown that I had to still fight for and figure out along the way. But I knew that that was the path I wanted to go down and take the risk going down that path. Thanks for tuning in to this K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. If you want to listen to our entire caffeinated career conversation, please check out the show notes for this episode. 
Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of t for c And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the Coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org, or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.